Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. Well, who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And what he do? And he's gonna react to all the self snitching. Oh. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another fun-filled episode of Criminal Lawyer Reacts. I'm Bruce Rivers, board-certified criminal defense lawyer. I'm board-certified by the National Board of Trial Advocacy and the Minnesota State Bar Association, which means I am a real lawyer. I have real experience, 25 years as a matter of fact, and I still try cases. I've tried 11 cases in the last 12 months. Today we're reacting to Alex Murdoch and his murder case. This is a very high-profile murder case, but before we react to that, Guess what? This is brought to you by eSign.com. eSign.com. eSign.com is an effective way to remotely sign documents. You can execute business in a flash. So let's say, for example, you're Alex Murdoch, and you're sitting behind custody, and you need to execute a document. They give you an iPad. Sometimes they do that in jail. And you, your lawyer says, look, I need another $100,000. Well, you need to sign now the dotted line. Otherwise, we're not going to continue to be your lawyer. Well, you can do that through eSign.com. You download the app, you get three free signatures a month, and it's amazing. I actually use it in my practice, and you guys can use it for anything, for your power of attorney, for any kind of document you need. You have people across country, you need to sign something quickly, you can have them do it through eSign.com. Follow the link below, download the app, you're covered. So let's talk about Alex Murdoch and what he's facing with the murder of his son and his wife so let's start out with what kind of a hole you're in the minute you're charged with killing two people charged i didn't say he's guilty i said he's charged with killing two people he's charged with killing his wife and his son heinous heinous crimes right i mean because if you believe he did it i mean who could really do something like that you have to be a monster to do that, and you kind of not want to believe it but guess what? When you do jury selection in a case like this, it's very tricky because you've got to find people from the defense perspective who are, are who don't believe right away. In other words, they presume your client innocent and they're going to do that throughout the trial. Tough duty. Because when you are, like let's say you talk about the nature of the crime itself is the hole that you're in. So the defense has got to dig their way out of the hole. So let's kind of go over some of the evidence that's in this case. So according to some court testimony just recently, uh, there was a text that was sent at 9.47 p.m. on June 7, 2021, after Maggie, his wife, was already dead. And then there were a few phone calls after that. And the prosecutors say that he was doing this, because Alex Murdoch sent this to his wife, in an effort to create an alibi so wherever you go no matter what you do you leave a digital footprint you just do because you have one of these things you have one of these phones guess what your location is on or your cell signal is on you make a phone call it goes to a cell tower it records your geographic lo uh, location so your gps coordinates and so if if alex murdoch is texting or calling his wife it's going to record where he is at that time, right? But it'll also record him going this way or going that way or going whatever way. So they have some text messages and a phone call to her saying, call me, babe, you know, whatever. And they heard testimony from an expert, Britt Dove, uh, who works in the computer crimes lab for South Carolina law enforcement. And um, she talked about her phone usage. And she, uh, she meaning Maggie, had made a phone call that lasted about three minutes. And then shortly thereafter, they're saying that it captured an image of, you know, the phone turns off and then, like, somebody picked the phone up abruptly and, you know, and it activated the camera. And all this data is captured on the phone, right? And, there, and the prosecutor is saying that this is evidence that the phone moved quickly and that uh, somebody had picked up the phone. So according to Ms. Dove, who is the state's expert on the phones, Maggie had made a phone call at 7.50 p.m. Now, at, let's see, and, and 
Alex's phone calls were like at 9.47, like two hours later. After that 7.50 phone call, 7.50 p.m. phone call, prosecutors say she never used her phone again. But at 9.07, after she's presumably dead, that's when the phone camera is activated. So if it's picked up, if you pick up the phone and you look at it, like if you just go like this, it activates, right? And so that, and that's recorded on the phone. And here's the other thing. Her phone was found outside the gates of the estate, like discarded somewhere. And according to Dub, her testimony was, it appears the phone was being moved and the cameras activating in the background to see if it would recognize somebody's face and that it would unlock it. Now, they're saying seconds later, the orientation of the phone changed. In other words, it, it moved this way or that way. And she can tell this by however. And that's indicative of somebody moving the phone. Now, when you have this kind of evidence, it, you can use it for the defense. Or you can use, I mean, it doesn't say that he necessarily touched the phone. It could have been an intruder that, that did that. So wherever Alex Murdoch was, it's, his whereabouts are going to be known because it, and the, the, the prosecutor is saying that he was visiting his mother and that was his uh, supposed alibi. But if he was really visiting his mother, that is an alibi, right? Shortly after 10 p.m., he calls 911. Now, is it intuitive that you would call 911 if you didn't do this? Of course it is because you, you, your wife is dead your son is dead and and they're gone down in a heinous manner of course or would you be smart enough because you're a lawyer and you got so much shit going on uh that you decide to create an alibi for yourself so you call 911 because you're going to be the first one they look at according to uh, maggie's phone there were three missed separate calls at, at a pro you know in the next 40 minutes between at approximately 9 47 p.m and a final text that said, call me babe. And then shortly after 10 o'clock, he supposedly stumbles upon the bodies and calls 911. Now the defense is saying that he was a, he was a loyal family man and he was a, a, a father and a good husband and all this stuff, right? But there's so many other questions and I don't know how much of this stuff is gonna come into play in terms of what's coming into evidence in this case. So when you have a case and you have a lot of bad facts, like a, the prosecutor wants to get other bad acts that really have nothing to do with the case itself but may provide a motive or context for somebody, um, what they do is you, you file motions ahead of time and then you argue that stuff ahead of time. So there's a couple things. He had a housekeeper that passed away under suspicious circumstances. And he somehow went, made off with four and a half million dollars of her money that she got from a, a, a settlement that he probably effectuated for her, right? So, and then there's also the fact that he embezzled from his own law firm and other crimes that he's looking at a host of other, a lot of other shit. And the prosecutor is going to try to create this picture that this is the guy who did all this stuff. And he did it. Why? He did it because he's sort of fucked. He's fucked here, he's fucked there, and and he is just he's he's gotta get himself out of this jam. And so if he kills his I don't get how he kills his wife and child, how somehow that maybe there's insurance. I, I don't know what the motive is uh, to kill his wife and son. According to court testimony, this guy who who was a very prominent attorney in South Carolina shot and killed the pair that evening. And they say that he changed his clothes and visited and visited his mother to establish an alibi. So they say that the, the phone and text rec records are just an attempt to create an alibi. So Paul was shot in the chest at close range. Maggie was shot multiple times and in the back with 300 blackout, which is like a 223 round only. It's a little bit bigger. And so that's like what you, ha what you have in, in It's kind of a specialized round. You wouldn't expect just some random intruder to have, you know, a firearm like that, right? I mean, it's it's kind of from an assault rifle, and so when you when you put all this stuff together, defense has a, a just a tough, tough, tough hill to climb. It's a circumstantial case, 
and we've talked on this channel about circumstantial versus direct evidence. There, there's no like ring camera that catches him in the act, right? There's no indoor camera that, that catches him doing X, Y, or Z. And we all know there's plenty of cameras all over the place. And her phone is found outside the gates of the estate. Now, if you look at where his phone is that entire time, that could be exculpable evidence worthy of an alibi. You know, I'm I was at I was at my mother's. But you could go see your mother, right? In a nursing home or assisted living facility. Leave your phone there. Go do them dirty. And then go back and no and you're not trapped. Correct? Right? You you could do that. That would be smart. I always said, and I, I won't ever commit a crime this way, so this is not self-snitching, but I always said if I was going to commit a crime, I'd take my phone and I'd either try to hide it and get on, the, get on the light rail or get on the bus and find some poor sod and put it in his backpack and then fucking take off. And then whoever is looking for me is going to look for that backpack, right? So if you're smart like that, and, he, and he's, he's an established lawyer, he knows how all this shit works. So his digital footprint is going to be minimized because he's a savvy consumer of the judicial system. So when initially confronted by police, Mr. Murdoch put a defense up that he knew what it was about saying his son was involved in a boat accident, saying he's been getting death threats. Most of them were benign, but we didn't really take it seriously. And here, let me tell you something, what people do when they get busted. People, nobody thinks really great on their feet. To be honest with you, I mean, you try to come up with some bullshit story, and it's usually going to fall flat, because there's, I mean, if if he's been getting death threats, has there been a police report? If there hasn't been a police report, is there any digital evidence of it? If there isn't any digital evidence, how do we know what the fuck you're saying is true? So he's trying to throw them off track. Here's the other thing: when you make all these statements, so for the, for example, he made a statement. Uh, that he was being kicked out of his law firm, that he'd been shot in the head, that he um, wanted to die because he wanted to leave his older son Buster a $10 million insurance policy. I mean, all that stuff's coming into evidence. Anything somebody says, anything a defendant says, because it's a statement of party opponent, you've heard me say that term many times, statement of a party opponent, that means the, per, the person that's going against the plaintiff, the plaintiff is the state, the party opponent would be the defendant. So anything out of Alex Murdoch's mouth that's remotely relevant to what we're talking about here and anything related to a motive is certainly going to come in. All that's, So you're really starting out in a hole. And the defense is saying this is all circumstantial. There's no hard evidence to suggest he did anything. And so as we follow this, even if he is acquitted of these homicide charges, he, he's facing all kinds of other theft and fraud charges and um, money laundering probably, some other major charges related to some financial mismanagement or you know some misappropriation uh, of funds related to his law firm. And why is that important? It's important because he can't take the fucking stand. He cannot take the stand because guess what? You know, some of this stuff only comes in if he testifies because it bears on his credibility, right? And so if he testifies, if he's not, he can't get up there and say, I didn't do this. And the reason he can't is because he's going to get eaten alive by any prosecutor because they're going to shove all this crap up his ass. Now, Guys with this much hubris, though, guy, and by that I mean full of ego, no concept of consequences, and, and it is go for broke. So he may wind up testifying anyway against his lawyer's advice because the lawyers will probably say, you, you get up and tell this bullshit story, you are going to get eaten alive. Maybe true, maybe not true. I don't know. That's, I, I'm just viewing it from my own lens, going through these processes before. So we're going to follow this case. 
And uh, there's a lot to this. There's a lot of moving parts. Tragic, tragic, tragic um, scenario for this family. Just absolute tragic. And, and, and I still don't have a great motive for him to kill his wife and son. Tell us about it in the comments. So we'll see you next time here on Criminal Lawyer Reacts. I'm Bruce Rivers. Thank you for supporting our channel. Make sure you sign up for Patreon. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter. Stay for Percy Mac. We'll see you next time here on Criminal Lawyer Reacts. Bruce Rivers is broke down your case. He know all the charges that you about to face. You ain't coming home till 2058. That self snitching gon' get you put away. Bruce Rivers just broke down your case. He know all the charges that you about to face. You ain't coming home till 2058. That self snitching gon' get you put away. 23 hour lockdown, please is that my god.